The Cross and Self by Arthur W. Pink Read by Eric Weathers Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24 Before developing the theme of this verse, let us comment on its terms. If any. The duty enjoined is for all who would join Christ's followers and enlist under his banner. If any will. The Greek is very emphatic, signifying not only the consent of the will, but full purpose of heart, a a determined resolution. Come after me as a servant, subject to his master, a scholar, his teacher, a soldier, his captain. Deny. The, The Greek word means deny utterly. Deny himself, his sinful and corrupt nature, and take it up, not passively bear or endure, but voluntarily assume, active, adopt. And take up, not passively bear or endure, but voluntarily assume, actively adopt, his cross which is scorned by the world, hated by the flesh, but is the distinguishing mark of a real Christian. And follow me. Live as Christ lived to the glory of God. The immediate context is most solemn and striking. The Lord Jesus has just announced to his disciples, for the first time, his approaching death and humiliation. Verse 21, Peter was staggered and said, Pity thyself, Lord. Verse 22, that expressed the policy of the carnal mind. The way the world is self-seeking and self-shielding. Spare thyself is the sum of its philosophy. But the doctrine of Christ is not save thyself, but Sacrifice thyself. Christ discerned in Peter's counsel a temptation from Satan, verse 23, and at once flung it from him. Then turning to Peter, he said, Not only must Jesus go up to Jerusalem and die, but everyone who would be a follower of his must take up his cross, verse 24. The must is as imperative in the one case as in the other. Uh, Mediatorially, the cross of Christ stands alone, but, but experientially it is shared by all who enter into life. What is a Christian? One who holds membership in some earthly church? No. One who believes an orthodox creed? No. One who adopts a certain mode of conduct? No. What then is a Christian? He is one who has renounced self and received Jesus Christ as Lord. Colossians 2.6 He is one who takes Christ's yoke upon him and learns from him, who is meek and lowly of heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. He is one who has been called unto the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Fellowship. In his obedience and suffering now, in his reward and glory in the endless future, there is no such thing as belonging to Christ and living to please self. Make no mistake at that point. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 27, said Christ. And again, he declared, but whosoever shall, uh, instead of denying himself, deny me before men, not unto men, it, it is Conduct, the walk which is here in view.
him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 33. The Christian life begins with an act of self-renunciation and is continued by self-mortification. Romans 8, 13. The first question of Saul of Tarsus when Christ apprehended him was, Lord, what wouldest thou have me do? The Christian life is likened unto a race. And the racer is called upon to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset. Hebrews 12.2 Which sin is in the love of self, the desire and determination to have our own way. Isaiah 53.6 The one great aim and task set before the Christian is to follow Christ, to, to follow the example, uh, uh, to follow the example he has left us, 1 Peter 2.21, and, and, and he pleased not himself, Romans 15.3. And there are difficulties in the way, uh, obstacles in the path, the chief of which is self. Therefore, This must be denied. This is the first step toward following Christ. What does it mean for a man to utterly deny himself? First, it signifies the complete repudiation of his goodness. It means ceasing to rest upon any of our works. It means ceasing to rest upon any works of our own to commend us to God. It it means unreserved acceptance of God's verdict that all our righteousness, our best performance, are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. It was at this point that Israel failed. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3 But contrast the declaration of Paul and be found in him not having mine own righteousness. Philippians 3.9 For a man to utterly deny himself is to completely renounce his own wisdom. None can enter the kingdom of heaven except they become as little children. Matthew 18.3 Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Isaiah 5.21 Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 21. When the Holy Spirit applies the gospel and power to a soul, it is to the casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 5. Uh, A wise motto for each Christian to adopt is, Learn not unto thine own understanding. Proverbs 3.5 For a man to utterly deny himself is to completely renounce his own strength. It is to have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3.3 It is the heart bowing to Christ's positive declaration. Without me, you can do nothing. Romans 15.5 Without me, you can do nothing. John 15.5 It was at this point Peter failed. Matthew 26.33 Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. 
Proverbs 16, 18. How necessary it is, then, that we heed 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Uh, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The secret of spiritual strength lies in realizing our personal weaknesses. See Isaiah 40, 29 and and, and, and 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Then, let us be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2, 1. For a man to utterly deny himself is to completely renounce his own will. The language of the unsaved is, we will not have this man reign over us. Luke 19.14 The attitude of the Christian is, for to me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 To honor, please, and to serve him. To renounce our own wills means heeding the exhortation of Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which is defined in the verses that immediately follows as that of self-abnegation. It, it is the practical recognition that ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 It is the saying with Christ, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Mark fourteen thirty six. For a man to utterly deny himself is to completely renounce his own lust or fleshly desires. Quote, a man's self is a bundle of idols. End quote. Thomas Manton, Puritan, 1620 through 1677, and those idols must be reputed. Non Christians are lovers of their own selves, 2 Timothy 3 1. But the one who has been regenerated by the Spirit says with Job, I am vile. Job 40, verse 4. I abhor myself. Job 42, 6. Of non-Christians, it is written, All seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Philippians 2, 21. But of God's saints, it is recorded, They loved not their own lives unto death. Revelation 12.11 The grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. Titus 2.12 This denial of self which Christ requires from all his followers is to be universal. There is to be no reserve, no exceptions made. Make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, 14. It is to be constant, not occasional. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. It is to be spontaneous not forced, performed gladly, not reluctantly, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord. Colossians 3.23 Oh, how wickedly has the standard which God sets before us been lowered! How it condemns the easygoing, flesh pleasing, worldly lives of so many who profess, but vainly, that they are Christians, and take up his cross. This refers to the cross, not as an object of faith, 
(laughs) but as an experience in the soul. The legal benefits of Calvary are received through believing when the guilt of sin is canceled. But the experiential virtues of Christ's cross are only enjoyed as we are, in a practical way, made comfortable unto his death, Philippians 3.10. It is only as we really apply the cross to our daily lives, regulate our conduct by its principles, that it becomes efficacious over the power of indwelling sin. There can be no resurrection where there is no death. There can be no practical walking in newness of life until we bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.10 The cross is the badge, the evidence of Christian discipleship. It is not his cross and not his creed which distinguishes a true follower of Christ from religious worldlings. Now, in the New Testament, the cross stands for definite realities. First, it expresses the world's hatred. The Son of God came here not to judge, but to save. Not to punish, but to redeem. He came here full of grace and truth. He was ever at the disposal of others, ministering to the needy, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, delivering the demon-possessed, raising the dead. He was full of compassion, gentle as a lamb, entirely sinless. He brought with him glad tidings of great joy. He sought the outcast, preached to the poor, yet scorned not the rich. He pardoned sinners. And how was he received? What welcome did men accord him? They despised and rejected him. Isaiah 53, 3. He declared, they hated me without a cause. John 15, 25. They thirsted for his blood. No ordinary death would appease them. They demanded that he should be crucified. The cross, then, was the manifestation of the world's inveterate hatred of the Christ of God. The world has not changed any more than the Ethiopian has changed his skin or the leopard his spots. The world and Christ are still an open antagonism. Hence, it's written, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4.4 It is impossible to walk with Christ and commune with him until we have separated from the world. To walk with Christ necessarily involves sharing his humiliation. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Hebrews 13.3 This is what Moses did. See Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. The closer I'm walking with Christ, the more I shall be misunderstood. 1 John 3, 2. Ridiculed, Job 12, 4. And detested by the world. John 15, 19. Make no mistake. Here, It is utterly impossible to keep in with the world and have fellowship with the Holy Christ. Thus, take up my cross means that I deliberately court the enemy of the world through my refusing to be conformed to it. Romans 12, 2. But what matters the world's frowns? 
<laughs> if I am enjoying the Savior's smiles, taking up my cross means a life voluntarily surrendered to God. As the act of a wicked man, the death of Christ was a murder. But as the act of Christ himself, it was a voluntary sacrifice offering himself to God. It was also an act of obedience to God. In John 10.18, he said, No man taketh it, his life, from me, but I lay it down myself. And why did he? His very next words tell us, This commandment I have received of my Father. The cross was the supreme demonstration of Christ's obedience. Herein, he was our exemplar. Once again, we quote Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In what follows, we see the beloved of the Father taking upon him the form of a servant and becoming obedient unto the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, the obedience of Christ must be the obedience of the Christian, voluntary, gladsome, unreserved, continuous. If that obedience involves shame and suffering, reproach and loss, we must not flinch, but set our face like a flint. Isaiah 50, verse 7. The cross is more than an object of the Christian's faith. It is the badge of discipleship, the principle by which his life is to be regulated. The cross stands for surrender and dedication to God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, your reasonable service. Romans 12.1 The cross stands for vicarious service and suffering. Christ laid down his life for others, and his followers are called to be willing to do the same. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16 That is the inevitable logic of Calvary. We're called to follow Christ's example to the fellowship of his sufferings, to be partners in his service. As Christ made himself of no reputation, Philippians 2.7, we must not seek a reputation, as he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Matthew 20, verse 28, so must we. As he pleased not himself, Romans 15, 3, no more must we. As he ever thought of others, so must we. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, them which suffer adversely as being yourselves in the body. Hebrews 13, 3, for whoever will save his life, will lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16, 25. Words almost identical with these are found in Matthew 10, 39, Mark 8, 35, Luke 9, 24, Luke 17, 33, and John 1225. Surely, such repetition argues that deep importance of our noting and heeding the saying of Christ. He died that we might live. 
John 12, 24. So must we. John 12, 25. Like Paul, we must be able to say, Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Acts 10, 24. The life that is lived for the gratification of self in this world is lost for eternity. The life that is sacrificed to self-interest and yielded to Christ will be found again and, and preserved through eternity. A young university graduate with, a, with, with brilliant prospects responded to the call of Christ to his life of service for him in India among the lowest caste of the natives. His friends exclaimed, What a tragedy! A, a life thrown away! Yes, lost. So far as this world is concerned, but found again in the world to come. <laughs>